Okay, well, now I'll talk about failure theories. Nastran includes a number of different failure theories, and the usual suspects are the Hill theory, the Hoffman theory, max stress, max strain, psi Wu, and you'll find virtually any finite element code will include these. Um, NEI in the last two years has gone a little further and have included a couple new ones. Um, one is the Puck failure theory, one is the LARCO2 failure theory, and the final one is what we call the multi-continuum theory, uh, which we uh, included through Firehole Technologies, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail in just a little bit. The Puck theory is uh, recommended by the uh, German Defense Institute, and the uh, it's a first ply failure based. So as soon as the matrix or anything cracks or fails, it's considered to be failed according to Puck. It uses an action plane approach. Uh, there's extensive validation for the Puck based on the worldwide failure exercise, and uh, that's always an interesting search if you do on the web. Um, we can talk about that if you give a ring to tech support or you do a web search, you can learn about that. But basically it's a series of test cases that were extensively tested with extensively validated and a lot of people verify their finite element capabilities for uh, composites against those. Um, and while Puck is a, a, results in a very accurate material characterization, it requires fairly extensive input data and it's the kind of stuff you wouldn't necessarily have. And I didn't put on here, but it also only applies to unidirectional unitape. So if you've got a Wolman composite, you can't use Puck. Uh, LARCO2 is in some ways similar to the Puck theory in that it's a collection of different criteria for different loading scenarios, namely both compression in both directions, compression in one direction, and tension in the other direction, and so on. And based on those different directions, it comes up with a different failure index based on the different loading ones. The advantage is it's a simple input. It agrees beautifully with many test results. But like Puck, it's only for unidirectional laminates. Once again, this is the tech paper that references it came out of NASA Langley, which is why it's called the LARC-02 theory. And if you have a woven composite, then you start, oh, here's the, the, the LARC-02 what it has is it has these different criteria. You have a separate for matrix tension, for fiber tension, for matrix compression, for fiber compression, and it calculates a matrix cracking and a fiber failure one, and then basically reports the, uh, the worst of the failure indices to you as the failure index based on these six different formulas. But if you have, as I said, the woven material, then you're talking about MCT, which is multi-continuum technology. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bill Wright from Firehole Technologies about that. All right, Bart. Thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate that. My name is Bill Wright. I'm the Director of Engineering for Firehole. So the problem in global format, and I'm sure many of you who've worked in the composite world for some time have heard this black aluminum approach before, but Typically, we take a ply and we go out and we perform a bunch of testing on it. We get the, the basic parameters, the basic engineering constants, if you will, E1, E2, and new one, two, and so on. We feed it into the FEA, and, and the FEA will then solve and spit out your strains and your stresses in, in a global ply sense. And then we go ahead and we take the black aluminum approach. We use things like Sai Wu or Sai Hill or, or whatever your favorite is. Look at the capability of your structure under that load in, in a global or in, in a macro capability. Next slide, please. MCT though breaks that constituent, or breaks it down into a constituent level, so it'll take the output loads from your FEA solver package, break it down, and put the participating forces and stresses into the fibers and then into the matrix, and it will perform the analysis on those constituents themselves. Next slide. So, so how does that work, and, and why is that advantageous to us? Let's uh, let's let's take a, a little example here on the left-hand side. If I take something very simple like a single ply, just a single ply with the fibers lined up, as you see there, in the one direction, and if I apply a compressive force to that in the two and the three direction, or imagine maybe I'm, I'm squeezing a razor in the two or three direction, so I'm, I'm extruding the fibers out of my hand, if you will. If you were to solve that in an FEA package and look at the results, sure enough, you would show that you would have stress of 200 ks fine compression in the, in the two and three direction, but in the one direction, of course, uh, you would see zero stress. 
But in real life, we're getting something quite different. And if we look at the MCT constituent breakdown that you see on the right hand side, you'd find that the actual fiber stress in the one direction is in a tensile case. So now, why might that be? And, and if we go back to our visualization here, where we're squeezing this eraser, the matrix, of course, has a much lower modulus. So it will squeeze out in the one direction, and it, it will essentially pull the fibers with it, right? So we're not surprised to see that we have a tensile scenario in the one direction. Uh, the matrix, on the other hand, shows uh, compression in the one direction. And that was not indicated before in the global sense. And why would that be? It's not real, obviously, until we think back to what the fibers were doing. Of course, we we stretch the fibers out. They want to return to their original relaxed condition. So they, they pull the matrix back in or compress it in the one direction. So not obvious. Certainly, though, we can see that uh, the sigma 1, 1 for a composite black aluminum sense versus the constituent breakdown is very different. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, and in fact, Bart referred to the WWFE uh, examples previously, and this is exactly one of those coupons. You can imagine on the right-hand side there, one of these coupons is uh, pipe-like, if you will, where we apply uh, uh, tension or compression on the ends of the pipe and internal pressure. Uh, the accuracy of MCT is, is very good. You can see on the left-hand side what the matrix cracking envelope would be, as well as the fiber failure envelope. Now, the fiber failure envelope would certainly be where you would end up uh, ultimately failing this composite. You can see that it falls very nicely on top of the experimental data. If you do this with uh, quadratic formulas, you find that the envelope is, is not, not, nearly, not nearly as close. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, another scenario that we uh, have to be aware of, this one might be a little bit easier to visualize, if you will, is uh, let's take the mechanical loads off our single ply on the left-hand side down. This time, we'll just apply a, a thermal delta T. In this, in this case, we're going to freeze this ply down, if you will. And if you do that, in an FEA package and solve for it and get the answers back, you're going to find that sigma 1, 2, and 3 uh, stresses are going to be zero uh, in, in the black aluminum case. Um, uh, the strains would, of course, not be zero, but the stresses would be zero. But in real life, that's not the case. Again, if we break it down using MCT or, or a, a continuum theory like that, we can see that uh, the fibers end up in compression. And that really does make sense because if it's a graphite, for example, if it's a graphite fiber where the CTE is very near zero, and uh, a matrix is, is a typical epoxy, maybe 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 inches per inch degree F. You can envision the, the contraction of the matrix down on top of the fibers, uh, contracting them and, and, and pushing down on them, putting them all in compression. In the lower right-hand side, we can see the matrix is in a tensile state. And I guess that makes sense, too, because the, the fibers, being the stiff product, are going to want to return to their original condition. And they will, they will push back out on the matrix, if you will, and end up putting it in tension. Why might that be important? Uh, next slide, please. Some of the newer tanks that are out there uh, are exposed to cryogenics. And if you solve for a, a, a tank using a, maybe a quadratic or maybe a max strain, uh, you might find that the capability of the tank is uh, well beyond the factor of safety you need. But you might find this, and you might remember the WWFE picture we had before where the matrix envelope is well inside the fiber envelope. You might get uh, through leakage in the matrix, and that itself uh, would certainly fail the tank. Uh, MCT uh, performed this analysis on a cryogenic tank, as you see here, and predicted leaking actually within in 2%. Uh, if you use, in the bottom bullet here, you use a, a typical uh, uh, failure calculations, they usually overpredict by around 100%. So something to be careful of. Next slide, please. And uh, other folks that might be interested in matrix cracking, certainly uh, if you're in the airspace field and you have uh, you build wings, or maybe you're in motorsports, as you see on the left, lower left-hand side here is a picture of a push-down wing for the front of a, of a racing vehicle, or maybe you build uh, launch vehicles. Uh, the stiffness of, of your products is, is very important to you. You can imagine if we had uh, matrix cracking on one of these parts and it changed the stiffness and therefore the, the natural frequency or the flutter capability of a wing, we would be in trouble indeed. The same thing for launch vehicles. If you're on a rocket, the uh, guidance systems defend, uh, depend very heavily on the consistency of, of the mode characteristic of that vehicle. And if we have matrix cracking and it changes that mode, we could certainly uh, lose control of the vehicle. 